which is really kind of what the loan estimate does, uh, and then walk you through that form a little bit. Aaron? Sure. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and I would say if you got, if anybody on the call does have access to these actual forms, it'd be a good idea to go ahead and pull those out. They're also available on the CFPB's website under their regulatory implementation page. If not, we do have screenshots in the following slides, but sometimes it's easier to get a grasp of them if you have a physical copy in hand. Without further ado, though, uh, like Mark said, these do combine different disclosures and different items into one integrated disclosure, hence the name Tiller RESPA Integrated Disclosures. The main items that are being combined are going to be the GFE and the TIL that we know right now. These, of course, are given within three days of application at the moment. So these will go away, and all that will exist is a loan estimate, which will be a combined document. It will be a three-page document, and we'll talk in more detail about it in a moment. Additionally, on that loan estimate, or LE, we'll have some additional boilerplate disclosures. Nothing you really need to be too concerned with, but these are the additional items that are being added on there. A few other items as well uh, is adding what is going to be referred to as a total interest percentage. This will be added in under the APR on the loan estimate. Uh, our till right now doesn't have that percentage, but this will be something that is added. And I will say that it can look a little bit scary at first because I've given a very simple example right here. And as you can tell, that interest over life alone expressed as a percentage can be rather large. And so I'll let uh, our, our mortgage uh, loan officer, Melissa, over here kind of walk us through how you might go about explaining that tip or the significance of that tip in a more uh, easy to understand fashion. So the tip according to our new disclosures is equal to what used to be the truth in lending that we used to disclose the day of close. Um, the difference to our borrower is that they used to see this in a numerical version of the finance charges, the amount financed, and the total paid over the life of the loan in, in a dollar format. Now they want us to have it in a total interest percentage, which tells them the same but more in a percentage. So it's a little overwhelming when they look at a 69% of their loan is interest versus an actual dollar amount. The way that we are looking to compete with this information is to use this more as a form of assisting them in paying down their loan over the life of the loan and saving the finance charges by working by a percentage rather than a dollar amount. In the past, we used to have to pull amortization schedules and walk through the schedule to help determine how much prepaid principal would save them in a finance charge. With the TIP, it's an understanding that they can actually use that as a simple calculation based on their principal reduction as to what percentage of finance charges they're going to save over the life of the loan. So as long as the lenders are able to use that as a tool to their advantage, it will not look as overwhelming to the consumer. It will actually help them control the interest paid on their loan more so than the dollar amount that we're accustomed to seeing on the truth in lending today. Right, right. And thanks, Melissa. And, and so to that point, while that percentage can look a little bit large, you have to take into account a few things. One, it is the total interest over the life of the loan. So that is if you stay in that home for the full 30 years or 15 years, whatever your loan term is, that will be the tip that is applicable. So it is interest over the entire life of the loan. And so that's one reason that percentage can look so large. Uh, additionally, it is supposed to just be a snapshot of how much interest there is on that loan before this is already disclosed, but just on an amortization schedule or some other document, and you had to look uh, through all the different line items to see how much total interest that was. Uh, additional items that have been added are a estimated cash to close table. This will be a good reference, I believe, on the loan estimate. Uh, previously on the GFE until, there was no easy way to determine what amount of cash was needed to actually close. So this is now being added to the loan estimate, should be helpful. And at the very bottom on the last page, there will be a receipt confirmation, a signature line that the bar can sign to document that they have received this document. I know that does not seem like such a, a significant announcement, but the current GFE has no signature line, so there was no good way to really document when a consumer or borrower had received that loan estimate. As we continue on through, this is page one of the loan estimate. This one's been completed with some model numbers from the CFPB, so this is the one directly from the CFPB website. And I just want to highlight a few items on this loan estimate. Page one is going to have some general information about your loan. So if you look there at the top, it's going to tell you things such as the applicants, the property address, loan term, purpose, product, 
if their rate is locked, yes or no. And then below that, we're going to get into the loan information, things such as the loan amount, the interest rate, their monthly principal interest payments. And as you continue on down, we get into mortgage insurance and any needed escrow amounts. And then also, if they aren't escrowing, there's also going to be an amount listed in that section called estimated taxes, insurance, and assessments. So that will let them know, in addition to those escrows, what other amounts uh, may be applicable to their transaction. Page two of the loan estimate, this is where we get into most of the cost disclosures on the loan. This is divided neatly into two general sections, loan cost and other costs. Loan costs are generally those costs assessed by the lender or as part of the loan origination process. Other costs are those costs imposed by third-party entities, generally government entities, or just other entities that are not under the control of the lender that would have to be paid uh, regardless. So loan costs, general categories that you're going to have are going to be origination charges, anything payable to the lender, so processing fees, application fees, those type services. Section B, services you cannot shop for. These are services which the borrower must obtain from a third party, but which, for they, but which they cannot choose that service provider. Some of these they cannot choose because certain lenders restrict it. Others, certain regulations actually don't allow a borrower to choose them. So for example, the appraisal, a borrower cannot choose their own appraiser, so that has to be chosen by the lender, but it is a third party fee. So fees like that go in services you cannot shop for. And then services you can shop for are gonna be fees which the borrower can choose provided by third parties on the loan transaction. A, a few items to note as well, any title services will be prefaced with the, the title of title, and it will have title and then the hyphen uh, before any title-related services. Our very last page on here is mostly boilerplate information. There's a little bit of contact information there at the top for the lender, and if they're utilizing a mortgage broker, then the mortgage broker as well. Then below that, we have an in five years comparison, and that may be deceptive at first to some folks, but that is actually printing on all loan estimates. It's not anything to do with an arm loan or anything like that. It's just in five years, and that prints on any loan estimate, no matter the loan term you choose. The, the CFB wanted to always have an in five years comparison on the loan estimate. Below that, we have the APR that we're familiar with, and then below that, there's that tip percentage that we referenced earlier. Then at the bottom, uh, additional disclosures, followed by that confirmation receipt that I mentioned before. You know, and kind of um, the great explanation there, Aaron, kind of walking us through the form, but one thing we wanted to do as a part of this presentation is really try to put the focus back on our audience for this, which is the realtor. Um, you know, so really at, uh, the subject line of this slide is, I'm a realtor, what does this all mean to me? So if we're looking from a pre-application to uh, the delivery of the loan estimate, a couple of questions that we at, at Renaissance have received uh, in a consistent manner from realtors and other people involved. Uh, one of the first ones that we've gotten a lot is, will I still continue to get pre-qualification letters? Uh, and answers out there to the right, our answer will be yes. Um, but one thing that I want you to understand is that uh, not only a Renaissance thing, but I believe most of your mortgage lenders will be providing a much more generic um, copy of a pre-qualification letter. And why is that? Well, if we actually have pre-qualification letters, which are very typical in Birmingham, that reference property addresses, for instance, what the specific uh, purchase price or loan amount that you're looking for, one thing that really changes with this rule is that there is a very clear black and white six pieces of information needed to, to create an application. Uh, once we do that, we have to disclose as the lender, and we are liable for the fees that we put on that disclosure. So what does that mean to us is that I'm not going to want to give you a pre-qualification letter with all the pieces of information required unless I have a sales contract and I'm actually ready to disclose with all my fees in hand. So you will still be able to get pre-qualification letters from your mortgage lenders, but I, I think one thing to understand is, is that they may be a little bit more generic than what you're used to. That does not mean that we don't have a credit-approved borrower, somebody who's been through AUS and their credit background analyzed, the pre-qualification letters are still good. They might just be a little bit more generic. Right. And to that point, Mark, there has been discussion as well with pre-qualification letters. Can I still, like you mentioned, get those those credit runs, AUS decisions? And and the short answer is, is yes, that, that will continue to be the case. What the rule emphasizes is that you can't make the loan estimate delivery contingent upon receiving other documents or verification documents. So once you've received the, the six items that TRID defines as the application items, then you have to disclose that loan estimate. You can't 
then go back to the bar and say, I've received all six pieces, but I'd like you to provide additional documentation so that I can get um, additional information on you. That is not allowed by the rule. And the basic rule of thumb is just to remember you can ask, but you cannot require those additional things. Most borrowers, I think, it won't be too much of an issue. They'll be happy to provide the additional doc documentation if they understand that it will, will help with the process speed things up. But that is just a, a point of clarification. Yeah, great point. Uh, thank you, Aaron. And kind of to that point, I know as a realtor, you're, you're thinking generic letters that makes it more difficult for me to write contracts to do, my, do the work that I need to do with my clients. And a question that we've gotten a lot of is, will, will my customers continue to get fee sheets to help write those contracts? And the answer, again, is yes. Um, but clearly across the top of it, it's going to say this is not a loan estimate. <laughs> so you'll still have uh, some fee sheets as you're typical or used to seeing to aid you in writing those contracts. Um, but again, they, they probably won't reference the property address and they will have some disclaimers across the top. So that's a question that we've gotten a lot. Um, will I, as a listing agent, be able to order title and select the attorney? Uh, this is something that's uh, kind of unique, as many of you know, to the city of Birmingham. And our answer to that is yes, but again, it, it's a but. Um, the reason that there's a but besides that is that you will need to verify with the mortgage lender that you're using that the closing agent is approved and the MLO must have those accurate figures prior to disclosing. So what does that mean? More important than ever is going to be the communication between your loan officer, the real estate agent, the borrower, the closing attorney, and all parties. Um, in order to be accurate on the front end, we've got to do a great job of communicating together. If we do that, I don't feel that we'll have a lot of interruptions in the business, but just understand one thing that's really important with the rule is that 100% of the liability for errors is now on the part of the lender. So that's a key thing to understand as a realtor. If we put something out there that is incorrect, we're held liable, not only for cures, but also open to lawsuits. So what's that gonna do if you think about it from a common sense perspective, if you're a lender, it's gonna make you be more conservative about putting out correct information. So when you hear some of that from your loan officers, um, be understanding to it and recognize some of the source. That's just kind of a, a message we've been trying to communicate out. Um, next question, if the buyer and the seller are negotiating a contract, should it be presented to the mortgage lender to start the loan process? Um, again, yes, but uh, to the point that I was just speaking, it's more important than ever to make sure that the lender has the final signed contract as early as possible in the process. Will it, uh, does that mean we'll never have changes to a contract? Will there ever be um, change orders or changes in the plans on new construction? Absolutely not, we know they will be, but we as the lender have to disclose those changes and we have to do so as early as possible once those changes are made. Understanding that is very important to making your loans close on time as you're used to doing. Um, so one question that we kind of pose at the front and then we'll kind of circle back around to it at the end there's been a lot of time, a lot of talk around, you know, how long should I write my contracts for? I believe the National Association Realtor has even put out that a 45 and a 60 day contract may be more appropriate. Um, so the question we're getting a lot here at Renaissance Bank is will I be able to write a 30 day sales contract? And let's kind of pose that question back at the end of the presentation. I wanted to speak as a, if you want to be an advocate for your closing attorney and for your title company, we are all local lenders and y'all are local agents. So not to speak on behalf of the out-of-state banks that may facilitate lending for your buyers. Um, if you want to be an advocate, utilize the Alta Best Practice and encourage those closing attorneys and the title companies that you use to collect their certificates and go ahead and start presenting those certificates to the banks and to the brokers so that we can do our due diligence to make sure that those attorneys and those title companies have been approved because by January 1st, if they have not presented that, then that's going to be what will either delay a closing while we wait for those attorneys to prove that they are suitable to perform closings according to CFP, CFPB law or it's going to, we're going to have to change the attorney, which could adjust some fees from title and closing purposes. But as an advocate for your closing attorneys and the relationships that you have here locally in Birmingham and in the surrounding areas, go ahead and start encouraging your guys to start presenting to banks and lenders the necessary information so that our compliance departments can ensure that those guys can be put on that contract. Great point, Melissa. Thanks. 
<clears throat> and uh, I'll let Aaron kind of, so that kind of sums up the first half of the major changes from a disclosure perspective, the, the pre-application through the loan estimate. And now we'll transition and take a look at the closing disclosure uh, and what changes that does. Aaron? Right. So the, the biggest change, I think, under TRID is going to be this new closing disclosure. The loan estimate is, is a, a change, but I believe the closing disclosure is where a lot of the attention uh, will be focused. Now, the closing disclosure at its most basic is a replacement to the final till and HUD one that we're used to. It combines those into one document, and then it adds a few additional items as well, uh, escrow breakdown, partial payment, some contact information, a uh, cash-to-close comparison, and, and more boilerplate disclaimers. Mm -hmm.